Hello everyone, I am Dr. Pallavi and today in this lecture we will be discussing the topic ichthyosis. Ichthyosis is a very short topic per se but it has become quite important these days because at least one question in an exam per year is asked from this topic. In routine classes we are not able to devote much time to this topic but now I am taking this as an opportunity to discuss the same with you. Hope you understand it and in case you have any doubts, you can put them in the comment section. I'll be more than happy to answer them. So starting with what kind of a disorder this is. So ichthyosis is a disorder of keratinization, also called as cornification. And what kind of a scale do you have here? As the name suggests, ichthys. Ichthys means fish. The kind of scale that you have here is called as a fish-like scale. So what are the important points here? One, understand that this belongs to disorders of keratinization and you have a fish-like scale here. Now what exactly is the problem that is happening with keratinization? If you've attended my previous lectures on keratinization, you will know that it is a process of maturation and migration. So maturation and migration of cells from the basal compartment, that is the stratum basale, moving up through these different layers, ultimately into the stratum conium. The cells then shed off by a process called as desquamation. So this entire process of these moving from basale to conium and shedding off, this is called as keratinization. And to give you a magnified view of how they look when they're in the stratum conium, you have these brick-like cells, which are enucleate, compact cells, full of keratin. So these are the keratinocytes and surrounding these keratinocytes you find this mortar, the cement which is keeping them intact making it an impermeable layer. And what is this cement composed of? It's composed of the lipids. So the brick here is the keratinocyte the mortar or the cement which is keeping these cells together making it an impermeable barrier to the surrounding allergens and all other issues that is the lipid mortar this is also called as the brick and mortar appearance of the stratum conium very important in maintaining the skin barrier the skin functions and the texture of the skin. Now, if anything goes wrong with this process of keratinization, the stratum conium will not be functionally proper and that is what will lead to a disorder of ichthyosis. So what happens in ichthyosis is the cells will keep adding to the stratum conium. The cells will keep adding to the stratum conium, but either there will be a problem in their compactness or their integrity, or there will be a problem with the lipid. So even though they keep on adding, adding and adding, they are not functionally normal. So you get an increased thickness of the stratum conium. So yes, the thickness will become higher, but the functionally skin will be abnormal. This is what is basically going wrong in keratinization. Clear to everyone? Then, what is the classification? When we talk about the classification, we divide ichthyosis into two types, congenital and acquired. Congenital, as the name suggests, the disease is due to congenital causes. There is a genetic mutation which is happening and this will be early onset visible early in the life of the patient. On the other hand, the acquired ichthyosis happens due to different diseases or disorders and they will be visible later in the life. So you classify that into congenital and acquired ichthyosis. The important congenital ones include ichthyosis vulgaris, 
X-linked recessive ichthyosis, laminar ichthyosis, and harlequin ichthyosis. All of these are important for MCQs. One of them will be asked. And then we have these different groups of diseases that can lead to acquired ichthyosis. Starting with the first congenital, which is ichthyosis vulgaris. Vulgaris, as the name suggests, most common. So this is the most common type of ichthyosis. This is the most common type of ichthyosis. Inheritance is autosomal dominant. Inheritance autosomal dominant. What is the gene that is defective? The gene is called as FLG and the type of mutation that you have here is a null mutation. Null mutation means it is going to reduce the production of the protein the gene codes. What is the protein it is coding? What does FLG mean? I'm sure you can you know guess the name of the protein from this gene. It is filagrin. FLG codes for filagrin. What is filagrin? Filagrin. So it is a filament aggregating protein very important for the entire process of keratinization and formation of skin barrier so if it is defective it is reduced in quantity you will have an abnormal skin barrier and reduced water content of the skin because it is not able to retain the hydration the important questions here include the inheritance, which is autosomal dominant, the gene that is FLG coding for filigrin, and you have an abnormal skin barrier in ichthyosis vulgaris. How does it look clinically? At birth, the skin of the baby is completely normal. So very important to note that at birth, the baby is normal. Once it happens within the first year of life. So once it happens in infancy. Typically, the scale looks like a fine white brani scale. So classically, the scale of ichthyosis vulgaris is described as fine white brani scale look at the image here can you make out the white scale the color of the scale is white and it is a small scale so it is a small scale which is why it looks like the bran which comes from the wheat classic description includes brani the color of the scale is white and it is a very fine small scale the skin becomes very rough due to this small white scale. So you understand this? Good. Now let us see how the distribution is. It involves almost the entire body, but the prominent involvement is of the extensors. So prominently, this disease involves the extensors and it spares the flexures. Look at the image here. Do you see that the extensors are involved while the flexures are spared so this is a disease which spares the flexures very very important it spares the flexures prominently involving the extensors if you take a histopath hyperkeratosis which means increased stratum corneum that will happen in all ichthyosis apart from that the specific finding is absent granular layer if you remember from anatomy of skin the granular layer contains the keratohyaline granules and these keratohyaline granules contain filagrin okay so this is an important question in itself that keratohyaline granules contain filagrin now in this disease i've already told you that filagrin is not there because keratohyaline granules 
will not be there because granular layer will not be there. So I'm just uh, telling you a way how you remember this. If you remember that filigrin is absent, you will automatically remember that granular layer is also absent. So in this disease, there is a absent granular layer. Very, very important question from ichthyosis falcaris. A probable question, I will say, not asked yet, but it can definitely be asked. The treatment for all ichthyosis is emollients. You have to increase the hydration of the skin, reduce the roughness. What are the associated features? Firstly, atopic dermatitis. How do you remember? Atopic dermatitis is also a disease where filagrin is deficient. So filagrin is deficient in atopic dermatitis. It is deficient in ichthyosis vulgaris. The second association is keratosis pilaris and thirdly it is palmar hyperlinearity. Look at the image here. These are the small small KPs which you see. They appear like small rough papules on the extensor surfaces. Uh, you must have felt a little bumpiness on your outer surface of the arms, on the thighs, the knees. So that small skin colored bumps which you see, they are all keratosis pilaris. What happens is the hair becomes coiled and skin forms an inflammatory reaction around the hair. So that is called as keratosis pilaris. Palmar hyperlinearity means extra lines on the palms. If any of you has an history of atopy, allergic rhinitis, conjunctivitis, asthma, atopic dermatitis, urticaria, you notice your palms will have extra lines. That is called as palmar hyperlinearity. Linearity. So the associations with ichthyosis vulgaris include atopic dermatitis, keratosis pilaris and palmar hyperlinearity. The common feature between IV and AD is the deficiency of filigrin protein. Clear? Good. Next we come to X-linked recessive ichthyosis. As the name suggests, the inheritance for this is X-linked recessive which means that the patients who come to you will always be men because the women or the females will be carriers. In X-linked recessive disorders, the patients are always male patients while the females are the carriers. If you get any image-based question of XLRI, it will always be a boy. And in case you get an image-based question with a girl with ichthyosis, rule out XLRI. That cannot be the answer. What is the gene that is defective? The gene that is defective is the STS gene, which codes for a protein called as steroid sulfatase also called as aryl sulfatase. So these are a group of proteins which will break down the cholesterol sulfate into cholesterol. Now, what is this function in the skin? If you remember from the brick and mortar pattern which I showed you, the mortar in between this that mortar, the cement, that's all cholesterol sulfate. For the cells to shed off, for desquamation to happen, the cement has to be broken down so the cells can be released. That cement breaking down is done by this enzyme. It will break down the cholesterol sulfate cement, release the cells so that the thickness of stratum condom is maintained. But in XLRI, this enzyme is deficient. This enzyme is deficient which leads to a very thick mortar in the cells so very thick stratum condom because the cells cannot be shed off they are retained in the skin it is also called as retention ichthyosis so you can get a question on this which of these is called as a retention ichthyosis the answer to that will be xlri because the cells are unable to shed off it is retained in the skin due to excessive lipid cement. Clear? Good. Now, how does it look like? At birth, the baby is normal. So at birth, the skin of the baby is completely normal. 
but it has an early onset within three months of age. So within almost the neonate life, you will start seeing the scales. Scales are typically, as you see in the image, they are large, dark brown, polygonal scales. So the shape of the scales is polygonal. They are larger as compared to what we saw in ichthyosis vulgaris and they are darker in color. Because they are darker in color, this ichthyosis is also called as X-linked recessive ichthyosis nigra. Or simply in some options, you may just see it as ichthyosis nigra. Nigra means black. So this is a type of ichthyosis where you get black scales. Okay, so remember the synonym, ichthyosis nigra for XLRI. The scales are classically large, dark brown and polygonal as you see in the image here. Mentally make a note of how it is different looking from IV. Now, what is the distribution? It is going to distribute on the entire body, classically involving the flexures. So again, another difference that you note from IV, classically involving the flexures and the face. So the images that I've shown you here, see the flexure, that is the neck, the face and the waist. So these are classically the flexures that are involved here. Sparing is of the palms and the soles. They are not involved in XLRI. Understand? How do you diagnose? Hyperkeratosis will be there. You will have increased thickness of the stratum corneum. What happens to the granular layer? It is normal. So the granular layer is normal. That's again another difference from ichthyosis vulgaris. So the differences here have been in inheritance, the classic scale and the distribution. Then when you do the histopath, the granular layer here is normal. Sometimes in some questions, it may say that the steroid sulfatase enzyme activity is low. So that is another test that we can do in the lab. We can test for activity of STS that will naturally be low in this disease. Treatment again with emollients. The associations very, very importantly mentioned as a hint in your exam is cryptorchidism, which means undescended testes. See, the steroid sulfatase enzyme is also important in androgen synthesis. If that enzyme is not functioning properly, androgen synthesis will also be, you know, or dysfunctional at some point which can lead to undescended testes. Undescended testes also has a risk of testicular cancer. So both of these can be associated features of XLRA. Very, very important cryptorchidism. Then the patient can have corneal opacities which are classically coma shaped and they do not interfere with visual acuity. They do not interfere with visual acuity. Okay, clear to everyone? These are coma shaped corneal obesities, but they do not interfere with visual acuity. Then in some female carriers, there can be history of a difficult pregnancy because again, for the entire process of labor to happen, normally you need androgens which are dysfunctionally synthesized in this disorder. Revise the association script orchidism, corneal obesities and difficult labor. Classically seen in the men patient, both of these can also be seen in the carriers as well as the patients. The next on our list is lamellar ichthyosis. Inheritance for this is autosomal recessive. So the inheritance for lamellar ichthyosis is autosomal recessive. The gene is TGM1. What is TGM1? Codes for the protein transglutaminase 1. So this codes for the protein which codes for enzyme transglutaminase 1 which is important for the function of keratinization. So if this enzyme is deficient, 
you have an abnormal keratinization. At birth, so at birth, in the previous two ichthyoses, I told you that the skin is normal. But in lamellar ichthyosis, at birth, when the baby comes out, what you see is a colloidion baby. What is a colloidion baby? As you see in the image here, the baby is encased in a translucent parchment like membrane. So here the baby is encased in a translucent plastic parchment like membrane which will peel off in about two weeks. So this one will peel off in around two weeks ultimately showing the ichthyosis that lies underneath. So what you have to remember in lamellar ichthyosis at birth the baby is born as a colloidon baby which is a translucent parchment like membrane encased on the baby important as an image based question also. You see this shiny plastic like cellophane paper covered around the baby that is the colloidon baby. Another question that you get is the electrolyte disturbance which can happen in these babies. The electrolyte disturbance normally seen is hypernatremia. So the electrolyte disturbance that you see here is hypernatremia. Seen at birth, thin parchment like membrane, peels off in two weeks leading to the ichthyosis. Have you seen the image? Make a note of the image. It can be asked as a image based question. And what I was telling you, see the cracks will appear. The thin parchment like membrane will peel off. And in around two weeks, what you see is this classic lamellar ichthyosis. So that is the natural history of this disease. How does it look like? The distribution is over the entire body. Nothing is spared. Distribution is over the entire body. The scale is large, dark, plate-like. See, lamella means a plate. Lamella means a plate. So what you get in lamellar ichthyosis will be plate-like scales. So when you see these big plate-like scales, this is the lamellar ichthyosis. And they will cause a tautness of the skin. Tautness means they will make the skin tight. So when this tautness of the skin happens on the face, it will stretch the eyelids, it will stretch the lips. So imagine the eyelids being stretched, the lips being stretched. It will lead to ectropion of the eyes and eclabium of the lips. If the skin around the frontal margin uh, and the temporal margin of the face is stretched, it can lead to loss of hair follicles, leading to a scarring alopecia of the hair margins. So these are some associated findings which you see here. Ectropion, eclabium and scarring alopecia at the margins. Now imagine your skin being so tight. So tight that it is stretching the eyelids and the lips and the hair follicles are dying. So what will happen to the other appendage in the skin? The other appendage is the sweat glands. So this kind of a tautness will even damage the sweat glands leading to what we call as hypohydrosis. And if you're not able to sweat properly, imagine a situation where your body temperature is increasing but you're not able to sweat properly. So you will be at a risk of hyperthermia. So these are some associations, hypohydrosis, hyperthermia. All these happen because of the tautness or the tightness of the skin. This image is clear. If you get an image of ichthyosis which shows this ectropion and eclabium, close your eyes and mark lamellar ichthyosis. I have not shown you anything of this sort till now. Her treatment Treatment for this is oral retinoids. Oral retinoids work well in treatment of lamellar ichthyosis. The retinoid that we use here is acetretin. Okay, so the treatment is oral retinoids, which is acetretin. The next type of congenital ichthyosis is harlequin ichthyosis, inheritance for which is 
autosomal recessive. So we read also autosomal recessive for lamellar ichthyosis. We are now reading it for harlequin ichthyosis. The gene is the ABC A12. What is ABC A12? This is ATP binding cassette. This is ATP binding cassette. This is important for the process of keratinization. Again, if it is defective, you will have abnormal keratinization. Remember the gene ABCA12, which binds for the protein ATP binding concept important for cornification. At birth, this is how the baby looks like. Important as an image-based question, often asked through multiple exams. What do you see here? At birth, you will see a baby who has a thick, shiny, geometric shaped scales on the body. So in this baby, if you notice, they have a thick, white, shiny, plate-like scale. So you know, these are actually plate-like scales cut in different geometric patterns on the body of the patient and there are cracks that are happening in between these plates. With these deep red fissures. So I'll just repeat myself. You get a baby which at birth shows thick, shiny, plate-like scales which are cut into different geometric patterns and the cuts are deep red fissures. Then you see this excessive granulation tissue around the eyes and the lips. The ears are poorly developed as you can see here. The ears are poorly developed. The fingers are tapering. These are all points that we need to remember. I'll repeat them. Shiny geometric scales which are plate-like, poorly developed ears and tapering fingers. That is how a harlequin baby looks like. Now, why do we call it harlequin? See, this is the reason. The geometric pattern that happens on the body of the patient here is similar to the clothes that were worn by comedians back in the 16th century. So this comedian here is wearing a suit which is called as the harlequin suit, which has these geometric rhomboid shape on its clothes. Here, the baby has a similar picture which is why it is called as a harlequin ichthyosis. The treatment for harlequin ichthyosis is also oral retinoids. So treatment for this is also oral retinoids. You normally get this as a question for image based. So if you can identify the image, harlequin ichthyosis is done. You have to mostly differentiate it from a colloidon baby. So in a colloidon baby, it will be a shiny plastic cellophane like membrane on the body of the patient. Harlequin will have these thick, thick plate-like scales with deep red fissures, with red eyes and red lips. So both of them very different, but you should know the differences. Next on our list is the Netherton syndrome. You get questions on Netherton in pediatrics also, and you can get this from here. The inheritance is autosomal recessive. The gene is pink 5. So the gene is pink 5 which codes for a serine protease inhibitor. The serine protease inhibitor is important for keratinization and this is also important for immune regulation. So if this gene is defective, you will have abnormal keratinization, abnormal immunity. Remember the uh, mutation? The mutation is Pink 5, which codes for a serine protease inhibitor. Now, what is the triad of Netherton syndrome? Very important to remember the triad. There is something which is going wrong in the skin, in the hair, and in the immunity. So, in the skin, you have ichthyosis that naturally has to happen if you are discussing it in this topic. In the hair, you have trico. Rexis in vaginator and in the immunity you have history of A to P and increased immunoglobin E 
levels. So what is the triad? The triad includes ichthyosis, trichorexis invaginator and A to P which means increased IgE levels. Sometimes in some questions you may also be given as erythroderma because at birth of the baby the skin is also red. So in some triads it may be written as erythroderma but that erythroderma is actually ichthyotic erythroderma. So remember this triad. Let us talk about the skin. As I told you, in the skin, the baby is born with a completely red skin, which is called as erythroderma, ultimately leading to the visibility of underlying ichthyosis, which is the scaling. The typical ichthyosis in these patients is called as ichthyosis linearis circumflexa. So the typical ichthyosis that you have here is called as ILC. What is this? I L C, where you have this double rim scale. As you can see in the image here, you have a double rimmed serpiginous scale. Don't go into the details. It is generally not even asked as an image based question. Only the text is asked. So you should know ILC, which is ichthyosis linearis circumflexa. It is a double rimmed scale, which looks like a snake. So it is called as a serpiginous scale with upturned edges that is i l c you can also see this in the image here in the hair we have trichorexis in vaginator where the distal end of the hair is telescoping into the proximal end so there is a telescoping of one segment into another segment and wherever which is why it is called as invaginator and wherever this telescoping happens visibly on the hair there is a node as you can see here do you see these nodes here so these visibly on the hair will look like nodes this is trichorexis invaginator and these nodes give it another name that is called as bamboo hair so where do you find bamboo hair that is the Netherton syndrome. Clear to everyone? These are bamboo hair. Trichorexis invaginator seen in Netherton syndrome. In this year's INICT exam, which was just conducted 10 days back, they had a question on trichorexis invaginator. The treatment of Netherton syndrome, it is very important to remember that you do not use any retinoids. Why? Retinoids tend to increase the dryness of skin. They tend to disrupt the skin barrier further. So when these patients have tendency to A to P, they have a tendency to allergies, you do not want to increase that. So you don't give any retinoids in Netherton syndrome, just treat them with plain emollients. Next, we come to Refsum disease. The inheritance for this is autosomal recessive. So the inheritance is autosomal recessive. Here, there is a deficiency of an enzyme which is called as phytanic acid hydroxylase. It is an important enzyme which is present in the peroxisomes. When it is deficient, you have a disorder of lipid metabolism where there is a excessive tissue deposition of phytanic acid leading to multiple problems throughout the body. If you remember, you also read this in ophthalmology as one of the syndromes associated with retinitis pigmentosa. So that is where we normally read about the Refsum disease. It has a constellation of clinical features, peripheral neuropathy, cerebral ataxia, cranial nerve dysfunction, cardiomyopathy, skeletal abnormalities but what I am concerned with is ichthyosis. I have recently found a mnemonic which allows you to remember Refsum disease better. That mnemonic is called as spinach. What is spinach? No, it is not what Popoy eats. It is what we do to remember Refsum's disease. S here stands for, what is S standing for? Skeletal abnormalities. So S here stands for skeletal abnormalities, which is the epiphyseal dysplasia. P is for peripheral neuropathy. I stands for ichthyosis. 
N is night blindness, which is actually due to the retinitis pigmentosa. A stands for A taxia. C stands for cardiomyopathy and H is just for hypokeratosis which again is a skin manifestation. Okay, so this is the mnemonic for retinitis pigmentosa. You get questions on cerebellar ataxia, cardiomyopathy, ichthyosis and retinitis pigmentosa. Next we come to trichothiodystrophy. Trichothiodystrophy is a disorder of sulfur metabolism. So this is a disorder of sulfur metabolism in the body. The inheritance is autosomal recessive. So the last ichthyosis that we've read, the last four, five, all of these are autosomal recessive. The mnemonic which you remember for trichothiodystrophy is called as IBIDS. I B I D S, where I stands for ichthyosis, B stands for brittle hair, another I for intellectual impairment, which is actually mental retardation. So you get ichthyosis, brittle hair intellectual impairment which is mental retardation d is for decreased fertility and s for short stature so these are the different clinical constellation of symptoms that you see for trichothiodystrophy starting with i bids ichthyosis brittle hair intellectual impairment decreased fertility and short stretcher. Now, what is the image that I have given here? What is this image? Again, this was one of the options in the AIMS or INICT exam asked just in November 2020. This was one of the options. The image that I've put here is called as tiger banded hair. So you get these alternate light and dark bands on the hair. This is the tiger banded hair. It is the typical alternate light and dark bands which you see in a patient of trichothiodystrophy. It can be an important image based question. So you've seen a hair image, trichorexal invaginata, then you've seen another image that is TTD, trichothiodystrophy. It is a disorder of sulfur metabolism but it has a clinical feature of ichthyosis which is why we are discussing it here. But remember this image of tiger banded hair? This is trichothiodystrophy. Having finished with the congenital ichthyosis, let us now discuss the acquired ichthyosis. They will come later in life. The most important cause for acquired ichthyosis is malignancies, amongst which the Hodgkin's lymphoma is the most common cause of acquired ichthyosis when we talk about malignancies. So the most important malignancy with acquired ichthyosis is Hodgkin's lymphoma. Well, you also see that with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but this is the most common. Amongst the endocrine causes, remember hypothyroidism, in the infections, leprosy very very important and HIV AIDS. So these are two most common infections associated with development of ichthyosis. In the drugs you get questions on clofazamine, then nicotinic acid and Statins. So these last two drugs, which are nicotinic acid and statin, these are all lipid lowering drugs. So when we give these lipid lowering drugs, it not only reduce the lipids in the blood, they also reduce it in the skin, leading to a dry, ichthyotic skin. The questions can be asked on all of these. The Hodgkin's lymphoma, hypothyroidism, leprosy, HIV, clofazamine, 
nicotinic acid and statin very very important to remember these causes with clofazamine remember the skin becomes reddish brown so you have an image of a red brown discolored skin with fish like scales that is clofazamine with this we finish our discussion on ichthyosis in case you have any doubts you can put them in the comment section i will be answering them as soon as possible and study well study hard all the best